many people know what DSI is even? Like raise your hands. How many people don't know what DSI is? Spirit, that was funny. Okay, so um, I will just make this um, very brief to begin with. So this right here is the third um, DSI event that we have thrown. Um, so it's, it's sort of growing and, and, and being very nice. Um, and like in a, in a sentence, like what is DSI? So decentralized science is like, how do you use the blockchain to accelerate science or to make science more reproducible or to make science more fair? And it's like a community of people who are sort of coming together all around the world. So at DSI NYC, we're trying to be a little bit like of a leader in this, in this space. So um, one of the things that we were just putting an initiative of today um, we're starting a DSI job board. So a lot of people are really interested in decentralized science but not knowing where to start. Um, so if you go to like DSI.job, there's like a Google form and we're just like seeding it with new information. Um, so people are looking to hire people and then shortly we will collate all that data together and create a, um, oh wait, let's actually just maybe uh, collate all that information together and, um, and start posting it. Um, the second thing is that we're doing is we're starting like um, this website called dci.cafe. So we got together with um, New York, London, Tel Aviv, and Tokyo, and we've like established a really strong connection with um, these other decentralized communities. And we're going to start sharing events, sharing people that are going, sharing lists, and trying to create like a more uh, global uh, decentralized community here. And so that's at dci.cafe, and we will uh, go from there. Um, the second thing is, uh, a, this is just a, sec a separate thing. We have a book launch coming up on February 21st, if you guys are interested in this book on uh, how to form a company. Um, it's going to be at Launch House. It will be very cool. Um, later today, there will be three copies. They're a little delayed, but they will be here, so you guys can take a copy. Um, I wrote the book. Um, <laughs> Um, DSI number four is already in the works, so um, it's going to be on March 14th. Um, Martin Shkreli agreed to come speak uh, <laughs> to talk about uh, drug, drug Life, which is this company that, um, that uh, looks into Amen. decentralizing, uh, like, hello, like, hello, oh, hello, hello, uh, one second, we'll be there in a second. <laughs> Uh, looks into decentralizing mm -hmm. drug discovery, which yes. would be very exciting. Okay. Um, here's the link if you would like to scan. Uh, uh, good. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to that, actually. You know Grant Pensionick at Caleb's Law? Yes. Okay. Um, if you're interested in, in that. And then next, we have a very cool logo here. Um, we have a secret DSI NYC chat, so you guys can not just um, be here when. <laughs> oh, uh, I should have censored that. Oh well, it's not the secret anymore. Uh, but you can apply. We try and keep a little bit of a barrier here, so that like, the group chat actually has some quality of information, uh, as opposed to just being like a bunch of GMs every second. <laughs> it's like, super valuable. <laughs> so you guys can take a picture of that. I need all the that to get out of the way. Um, it's on the invite to the link if you, if you like that. And then um, we would of course like to thank Union Square Ventures for providing this amazing space in Union Square. Uh, we're always looking for space, so if you have space that you're willing to, get, if you want us to bring an amazing group of people, just let us know. Um, and then lastly, uh, the thing is brought to us by DBDAO, which is the company it's like a database for Web3. When I started, we have a bunch of people working on it. We uh, power a lot of the DSI projects in allowing them to uh, like collect data from their patients, and then each patient like submits like how a drug is working for them, and then you get an NFT of your submitted data that you can then buy and sell. But then you collect all those um, patient records together and then you can do SQL queries on top of it and do like a decentralized uh, clinical trial, which is very cool. So you're able to use the power of 100,000 first in Reddit communities to do, decent, to do new types of uh, clinical trials, whereas previous things had like 100 patients that were all of a similar type of person. So DBDAO is the one that uh, sponsors and organizes the thing. Okay, 
So, uh, without further ado, we have two very esteemed guests here. Um, the first is, uh, we're going to start with, uh, all right, here we go. Yep. So hi everybody, my name is Balaj. Uh, I am calling from Budapest, Hungary, which is uh, 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 six hours ahead of the New York Times. Zone, so it's getting pretty late here, but nonetheless, I'm excited to um, give you guys a little presentation. Awesome, yeah, yeah. just uh, take it away. We have some sound looping issues. Okay. So then I'll just I, go I to met the... Laws, um in London at a DSI conference, and he was telling me about his psychedelic research that he was doing, and I was uh, it was very cool, and he had a lot of energy, and I thought he would be a perfect speaker for um, DSI NYC. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm just going to go to presentation mode, so um, just uh, stay with me for a sec. And, okay. There you go. Boom, boom. Okay. <clears throat> so hi again, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm Balaj. I am currently in Budapest, which is my hometown, but I actually work at uh, the Center for Psychedelic Research in um, London. And the way that I ended up there is through a study which is known as the self-blinding microdose trial. Um, if you do not know, microdosing is a new way of using psychedelic drugs, and basically it involves using small doses of psychedelics, but relatively uh, frequently, multiple times a week. So don't think about the overwhelming experiences, meeting God and cracking the source code of the universe kind of dose. We're talking about 10 to 20 percent of what is considered a normal recreational dose. Now, microdosing has become big in the mid-2000s or somewhere around that, and it has been claimed to be a cure for basically everything at uh, this point. So it is a very uh, uh, interesting phenomena that has gained a lot of attention, but there is really uh, uh, scientific research is lacking on microdosing. We don't know a whole lot about it. And um, one thing that immediately comes to mind when it comes to microdosing is, is the placebo effect. Uh, which is one of the most robust effects in um, all of medicine. So actually, when I became interested in microdosing, I was working in New York at the Mount Sinai Hospital. I was working there as a biomedical software engineer, so doing very different things. And I wanted to do a placebo control study on microdosing, but quickly found out that nobody's going to give me money for that because it is just way too expensive. So initially, I was quite frustrated by that, but then I realized that, hey, actually, I don't need a, a classic clinical trial to run a placebo control study on microdosing. And uh, the way that we can solve this is, is this concept of self-blinding. Now, when I say blinding, I mean it as a technical term. Uh, in, in, uh, 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 in medicine, blinding means that you do not know what you are taking. So in most of modern medical research, what is happening is that you are taking a medicine, but you do not know whether you are taking an active medication, which is being tested in the trial, or whether you take an inactive placebo, and this lack of knowledge, uh, we are calling it uh, blinding. Now, self-blinding is basically a methodology how we can take this placebo control and basically implement it at home. Self-blinding is a methodology that allows self-experimenters to implement their own placebo control at home without uh, clinical supervision. And that leads to some really interesting uh, uh, questions regarding what exactly that you value in uh, your evidence and, uh, 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 and, and, and what you consider high quality um, medical uh, evidence. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So first, let me just briefly explain what exactly is self-binding or rather how it works. So bear in mind, we tested this in the context of microdosing. So basically, small pieces of blotter paper that happened to contain some LSD. And the first step was is that we asked participants to hide these microdoses inside non-transparent gel capsules. Now, it was critical for the experiment that the capsules were uh, non-transparent because empty capsules were um, used as placebos. So basically how the experiment worked is that participants had to prepare two piles of capsule, one of them with the microdoses, the other one, the anti-capsules. 
and had to put each of these capsules uh, together with their QR code in these little zip bags. And they did that one by one. And what's important is that there was a specific set of QR codes for the microdose capsules and another specific set of QR codes uh, for the placebo capsules. So each of these capsules were put into a bag together with a QR code. You seal the bag and then you put it into a big bowl. So eventually all of the capsules made their way into this bowl, but together with the QR code, which is critical because that is what is going to allow us to track who is going to do what. So once all of the capsules were inside these uh, zip bags, the participants just shuffled them, randomly selected one, and then scanned the QR code, which was in the bag together with the capsule code. Now, when the QR code was scanned, it actually linked with the IT infrastructure of the experiment, and it told you what to do with that capsule. And basically, it either told you to discard that capsule. So for example, if you're in the placebo group, then we had, had to make you to discard your uh, microdose containing capsules. Or it told you something that you're gonna need to use this capsule on, uh, let's say the uh, second Monday of the experiment, something like that. But basically participants kept scanning these capsules and they ended up with half of the capsules allocated to a dosing regimen that lasted one month or it was discarded according to their um, randomized uh, treatment allocation. So there are lots of details that I skipped over here, but I wanted to give you a bird's eye view of what is uh, self-blinding. This is now published paper. It was published about two years ago, yes, in uh, March of 2021. So uh, if you Google self-blinding microdose trial, then you will find it on eLife. It's an open access uh, article, so uh, everybody can uh, read it. Um, so what was really cool about this study, or one of the cool aspects of this study is already shown on this figure, which is basically a flow chart of the participants through the study. And I have highlighted with green the number that's important on this figure. This study was completed by 191 participants, making it one of the largest studies, one of the largest placebo control studies on psychedelics. Actually, I'm just noticing that the, at the top, it says largest placebo control study on psychedelics to date. It was true when the study was published, but unfortunately, just a few months ago, there was a study published by Compass Pathways that had, I think, 220 participants, so barely more than us. But anyway, ours is not the largest placebo control study anymore. However, what is a very important difference between that uh, uh, the COMPRESS trial that I have mentioned before and the current trial, that the costs here were about half percent of an equivalent clinical study. And this uh, 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 very significant cost reduction is something that I'm gonna come back to when I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, self-blinding methodology and its uh, 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 advantages. So with this presentation, I don't want to talk about microdosing too much, but there is just like, I wanna give you like one result because I think this is important for a lot of the self-experimentation and something which I don't think people often get. So what I'm showing you here, this is one of the outcomes that we measured in the study, and this is mindfulness, but what I'm showing you here is generally true for all of the scales that we had in the study. And what I'm going to focus here is the change between the pre-regime to the post-regime. So this is that four weeks where people are either taking microdoses or they are taking uh, placebo capsules. And right now on this figure, I'm only showing you the results from the microdose group. So people who have been taking microdoses for this uh, four weeks long uh, dosing period. And as you can see, the mindfulness actually increases and uh, uh, it does so in a statistically significant manner. So what does that mean is that in a way we can uh, confirm all of the positive anecdotes about microdosing, at least the ones that claim that it, in, it, it, that it uh, increases mindfulness. If you have experimental evidence here that it, it really does. So in a way, this is good news for uh, microdosing. What's going to be interesting is when I add in the blue line, the placebo control group to the figure as well. So as you can see, the placebo control group, uh, their mindfulness scores are also increasing from pre-regime to post-regime. And what's crucial is that the between group difference is not significant anymore. So what I want to emphasize is that 
there are two comparisons that we are making on uh, this figure and generally with clinical trials. And one of them is the change over time, which is basically the difference between the measurement in the post regime and the pre regime. And the other important one is the, the other comparison that we're always making is the between treatment difference, which is in this case is between the uh, placebo control condition and the microdose group. So as I said, in a way, what we have found with this trial is that microdosing does have some benefits, but those benefits are not larger than the placebo effect. And I think this is important to, to emphasize that what we find is not that microdosing does not have an effect. We clearly show the opposite, that microdosing does have an effect. It is just that effect happens to be not larger than the placebo effect. So when we published this study, this was one of the first big study of microdosing, and then there were a lot of headlines that imperial scientists show that microdosing is just placebo. But that's not exactly true. What we only showed is that the, the, the magnitude of the effect is not larger than the placebo effect. So I think in a way, we, we, we really validated a lot of the anecdotes about microdosing, but we just added that, oh yeah, there are all these benefits to microdosing, but these can be reproduced just if you are taking a placebo capsule thinking that it uh, may be um, a microdose. So as I said, what I show you here is this mindfulness scale, but actually this general pattern, what I explained is true for all of the other comps that, I, uh, that we have measured in the study. In, in the microdose group, there's always a significant change over time, and it is always in the direction of uh, uh, what you would consider a positive outcome. So in the case of mindfulness, mindfulness increases, but so does the placebo control group. And on not on uh, any of the scales that we have measured, there was a significant between difference groups. Uh, a, a significant between treatments difference, excuse me, it's getting late over here. Um, so, you know, what does this argue for with respect to microdosing is that it, it's likely that these benefits are not due to the pharmacological activity of the drug, but can be explained by uh, expectancy effects. Um, the reason why I wanted to say this, because the placebo effect is one of the most robust effects observed in medicine, and that's why the placebo control group is what we use as a standard to evaluate medications. So very often, if you are a biohacker or a self-experimenter, and if you're going to start a new intervention, you're almost always going to see some positive improvements. That's it. what is surprising if you don't see an improvement, but this is why exactly the, the, the placebo control group is measured as sort of like the threshold that an active treatment have to cross. If you're a self-experimenter and you start to take, I don't know, some new supplement for sleeping, it doesn't really, it, it's not really surprising that uh, uh, you feel like you are sleeping better. What would be surprising and what is considered good evidence if you show that you are uh, uh, sleeping better relative to the um, placebo um, control condition. Um, one of the things which I'm, I was thinking quite a lot while doing this study is this, this hierarchy of scientific evidence and, and where does cell blinding fits into this picture. So the reason why I think this cell blinding concept is so cool is because traditionally in academia, we are thinking about sort of like the, the low level observational studies, which would be on this figure, the, the cross-sectional studies. And then we have also the, the high quality evidence, the, the randomized control trials that you see towards the top of the uh, triangle in this uh, diagram. But the point being is that there is really not a whole lot in between. Like we, we tend to think that there's the low quality observational evidence and the high quality randomized control trials. And what I think is interesting about cell blinding is that it's, it, it sits in that gray zone in between those two classic study designs. It is clearly not an observational study because we have a placebo control condition, which by the way, is the control condition that most people are gonna care uh, uh, about. But on the other hand, it is also clearly not a, a, a clinical trial because to begin with, there was no clinic in our case. 
And also in, in the case of the cell binding microdose study, the participants were sourcing their, their own drugs, which leads to some questions with respect to the purity and the exact quantity of the drug um, that was used. So we cannot really consider it a, a, a control trial in, in the traditional sense. However, I think you know what's 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 important here is if you are putting the the cost of the study designs and 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 then I think you know uh, then you can make a, a strong argument for cell binding, because as probably many of you know, clinical trials are incredibly expensive. I work in the psychedelic space, and you know it's not it's not like, like typically. If you're putting a patient through a, a, a typical clinical study, then the cost per patient are going to be somewhere around 3,000 US dollars to 10,000 US dollars, somewhere in that range. But with the cell blinding microdose study, like basically the, 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 the costs are nothing. Like the entire cell blinding microdose study costed us about 10,000 US dollars. So roughly equivalent of putting one patient through a, a, a classic clinical study. So while on one hand, this is not a randomized controlled trial and it has some weaknesses relative to that, but it is incredibly cheap, which allows you to gather a much larger sample size, which to some degree is going to counteract the lack of control uh, uh, um, in the experiment. So one of the beautiful examples of this is that we have calculated what is the threshold microdose dose when it becomes perceptible. So when people can uh, uh, guess whether they have taken a placebo or a microdose at a higher than chance rate. And we did the math and what we've calculated is that it's, it's 12 micrograms of LSD, this, this threshold dose. And a year after we published our results, there was a classic randomized clinical trial coming out from the University of Chicago, and they have calculated the exact same uh, 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 threshold and what they found in their experiment that it was 13 micrograms, which is practically speaking the same as our 12 micrograms. So even though we, we, we lagged really uh, uh, um, a confirmation of what was the dose, but because of this very, very large and this very, very large sample size that counteracts the, the lack of control. And uh, that's why we are very excited about uh, self-blinding. Uh, so as I said, yes, the, the costs are incredibly cheap, incredibly low, and, and that's what makes self-blinding, or one of the reasons why self-blinding is uh, uh, interesting. And for this very, very low price, it has this placebo control, which as I said before, is the most robust effect in medicine uh, that you would like to control for. Now, another big advantage of this methodology is that you're not really tied to a clinic anymore. If you are running a traditional uh, clinical trial, then you can only recruit in the area where the clinic is based so that patients can come into your clinic and then you can treat them and whatnot. But here, everything is running through the internet. There is really not like a central clinic where people have to be, and that allows you to recruit patients globally, again, leading to that high sample size that is going to make your uh, statistical um, inferences uh, that much uh, stronger. Now, the last point that I want to make is about external validity, which is really the, the technical term for uh, the fact that in clinical trials, uh, we are often testing medications in a very artificial environment. It's not uncommon that uh, uh, the results that we see in a clinical trial are not replicated in more naturalistic studies. So very often, for example, what happens is that the FDA approves a new medication based on data from phase three trials for condition X, and then when that medication hits the market, and then we are tracking the outcomes in real life, the effect sizes are much smaller than what we have seen in the phase three trials. And really the reason for that is because when you're setting up a clinical study, you have a lot of little decisions that you make in how exactly you are setting up your, your trial. And, that are and, and those decisions are going to influence the outcome of the study. And guess what? If you're a big pharmaceutical company, then you're going to put basically, you're going to make uh, everything that you can do to make sure that the study results are positive because you have put millions of dollars into that drug. So basically, the, the clinical trial allows 
really the, the drug companies to, to cheat a little bit, but how to put it like cheating is like more like sort of like biasing the results towards the positive. And if you have done a few trials, then you know exactly those little tricks that you can play in order to make sure that your study designs are, uh, uh, that your study results are uh, going to be uh, positive. So one of the most common ones is the inclusion exclusion, inclusion exclusion criteria. So very often patients who are enrolled in a clinical study are much healthier uh, relative to that population that is going to use that medication after uh, the FDA um, approval. So the point that I'm trying to make here really is that, uh, yes, this cell blinding methodology is not as well controlled as a clinical study, but actually that is a pro in some ways because clinical studies are highly artificial that are sort of like controlling away the elements of real life. So for example, in clinical studies, often they check whether you have taken the medication by uh, a blood sample or a urine sample, something like that. And you can easily imagine a scenario where uh, 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 you know, patients who are uh, in the uh, uh, FDA data package where the, uh, based on which the drug is going to be approved only contain patients that have taken the medication exactly as it was prescribed. But guess what? In real life, people often just forget to take their medication. So if your medication really requires to take it every single day, you know, that may not be effective in real life because in practice, people are just going to forget their medications. That's just the, that's just the way it is. So that's this point of external validity that how well your results in a clinical trial are going to transfer uh, uh, to real life. I feel that this is one of the big advantages of cell blinding, that it is completely naturalistic. And because of that, what we see in a cell blinding study, the outcomes are much more likely to be uh, transferable to um, a real life uh, use case. So as far as I know, the cell blinding microdose trial is the only cell blinding study that was ever uh, published. But I think you know we, we we need to appreciate that cell blinding could be done with with other things as well, not just with psychedelic microdosing. Take any supplement that's out on the market, and we could easily study it with the cell blinding methodology. And what my vision is, or what I would like to work towards, is setting up this general cell blinding platform, where if you're interested in a supplement, you can just order a cell blinding kit that contains all of these, these gel capsules and the QR codes and the zip bags and all of these little items that you need for self-blinding. And then you will order it and then do the self-blinding. And then you will test on yourself as an N equal one trial, whether that intervention is going to work better than placebo for you. And I think what's really, really cool about this is that uh, it allows, it, 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 in a way this is personalized medicine. Like often drug, well, drugs are approved based on the average effect across a sample. But you know, you may or may not be representative of that sample. But with the self-blinding methodology, you can run an N equal one study and figure out whether that given supplement is helping you better than placebo or not. So anyway, that's that's roughly what I am working towards. Uh, I have talk to stuff like traditional academic funding channels and, and there's just no way I'm going to get money for, uh, from them. I also talk to companies about this, companies that produce supplements, but what I have learned is that they, they don't want to test their products. Obviously, there is a lot of risk for them putting their trial, uh, putting their product through a self binding trial because the results may be negative, uh, just like they were, for example, in the case of uh, uh, microdosing. So teaming up with the companies didn't really work either. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm then turned towards the, the decentralized science movement of uh, trying to find um, allies there. I think this methodology is obviously very resonant with uh, 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 decentralizing science. So I went to the um, decentralized science conference where I met uh, Michael and that um, led me to being here. Um, our time is up fairly soon, so I'm going to stop here. But if you have any questions, I would love to hear them. And if you're interested in just chatting about self-blinding and how we could set up this uh, general self-blinding platform, then please feel free to reach out to me. You have my comments down here. Um, thank you for having me.
Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, can you tell people how to follow up with you? Um, yeah, my email was on the on the last slide. I mean, feel free, Michael. You know, just to uh, uh, if you have like an email, is just to put it there as well. Um, I can. Uh, shall I put it into the chat? Uh, just say it. Just say it out loud. Okay. <laughs> So the easiest one is on Twitter, Cybolash, so P-S-Y, and then my first name, which is B-A-L-A-Z-S. Sweet. Okay, right, let's do one question if someone if someone has a question here. Uh, uh, come up, come up, let's, do this, like, rapid, let's do this rapid fire. So um, you come up here and you can say it and you can hear it and then you can do it. And, and let's, let's try and keep it like 30 seconds for the answer. Yeah, so yeah, my, yeah, my yeah. question. Go ahead, go ahead. My question is really to um, you know, the talk was very interesting. Thank you so much. But I would relate this to decentralized science, and I'm wondering if the decentralization is the fact that the test was a home test, basically self-administered, and it's not a clinical trial, and that's your like perception or understanding of of decentralization of science, so it's something that you can do at home, or if you see any other connection. I mean, I think like, you know, decentralization, you know, there are like multiple layers to it, but I definitely feel like, you know, that the uh, uh, sort of like taking the, 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 the power away from the clinic and sort of like one clinical team doing the study, that is a form of decentralization. Now, decentralization have some other meanings, for example, where the data is stored, but I just see that as an additional layer of, of decentralizing science. So like, you know, this is not like, you know, if you are collecting data in a self blinding study, but then all of the data is stored in a central database, you know, that that's not decentralizing it. But I see these as independent variables in how we are conducting science. And the way that I look at it is this self blinding is, okay. is decentralizing <laughs> one layer of it. Let's keep, wait, 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 wait. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I was just wondering if the size of the placebo effect varies by person and how you're adapting for that? It is definitely variable. That's actually one of the reasons why placebo research is difficult to do because the effect sizes are notoriously variable depending on a very large number of contextual factors. So one of the most important is gonna be what's your perception of that treatment. If you're expecting large benefits, then typically the placebo effect is going to be larger. So if anybody is uh, interested in doing some supplements or trying microdosing, just try to be very, very positive about it, and then you're going to get at least a nice placebo effect. Amazing. Amazing. Can I have one more question? Yeah. Okay, go ahead quickly. We'll do a rapid fire. Go ahead. Hey, thanks so much for the talk. Quick question. How um, are you sorting out in your RCT or your pseudo RCT? Uh, always takers, compliers, never takers, and the buyers. So I said this again, there was just feedback, so I didn't catch the whole thing. With takers, suppliers, and never takers, and never... For your, for your, for your, for your uh, random control trial treatments, um, how are you sorting out always takers, compliers, defiers, and never takers in, in the scope of your trial? Oh, we, we, we just, the same way as traditional clinical trials, we just ask them whether they have taken the medication or not. That was when we published the paper, there were a lot of questions that, oh, how do you know that they have taken the, the capsules? But that is true for a traditional clinical trial as well. You just ask them and, you know, whether you believe them or not, that's another question, but uh, it's, 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 it's the same as in a traditional clinical study. Some people are going to lie. There's nothing you can do about it. Do you, how do you account for that? Do you do difference in difference? Uh, just curious. So, so say this again? How do you <laughs> okay. Um, let's let's let thank you for the applause. A um, we'll round of applause here. Thank you and make sure to um, get in contact. We have to keep moving here because of the room. And now we will have Tyler, who is a PhD student at U of A and studying all right, can you hear the song? Yes. Can we hear? Uh, uh, I can't hear you. Say, say, uh, say something, Tyler. Hello. Can you uh, hear me? Your mic isn't working, but it appears to be. I I hear you. I hear you, Tyler. Oh, oh, oh there you are. Oh, okay. There we go. 
Tyler, take it away. Okay, one second, sir. Sorry, I need to uh, just change a setting on my computer real quick. Okay, I have to jump off and then jump back on real quick. Sorry about that. So that I can share my screen. All right, can you still hear me? All right, we're good. We're good. Awesome. All right. There we go. All right. Can you see my screen? Just want to make sure. Yes, yes, yes. Cool. Uh, thank you, guys. My name is Tyler Quigley. I am a PhD candidate at Arizona State. Uh, my degree is in animal behavior, and I study the honeybee blood brain barrier for my PhD. So I've been studying this for the past seven years, for better or for worse. I've learned a lot about beekeeping and insect physiology and animal behavior. And animal behavior is an interesting thing to uh, think about because it's um, it's uh, it's the ways that it's a, one of the ways that animals maintain equilibrium in their environment. And animal environments can be complex. They can be unpredictable. They are however the animals coordinate their reactions to their environment through their central nervous system so we as animals we bring our internal state toward equilibrium by reacting to the perception of our environment so we perceive a temperature and we try to regulate that we perceive um our, our body perceives what we might need for nutrients and we are tended to uh, find that food source over another and this perception of the our internal state of our body, like how our how the inside is doing, is can be both sensory and non-sensory. Uh, an important information about our internal state is our blood. Our blood flows around, picking up molecules, delivering molecules, um, disseminating hormones, oxygen, and other things around our body. And our brain senses how our internal state is doing through what the blood is delivering up to it. And we have this barrier around our brain called the blood-brain barrier that modulates the interaction between the molecules in our blood and neuronal circuits. Um, and if you think about the blood-brain barrier this way, you can think of it as this dynamic filter and lens through which the central nervous system perceives the physiological state of the animal. So it's perceiving our glucose levels, what hormones are going around, peptides, proteins, and other nutrients uh, in our body, and is our, affecting our behavior or adjusting our behavior likewise. And the blood-brain barrier is essential to all animals with a central nervous system. And this provides an opportunity to look at it in a variety of different environmental contexts. And the one that I'm interested in and I've been studying is, the, of course, the honeybee. So um, the insect circulatory system exists as an open circulatory system. So whereas our blood-brain barrier exists in the blood vessels that infiltrate our brain like a net, like a net, the insect blood-brain barrier exists as a shell around the brain and their blood-brain barrier is composed of two layers of glial cells which form a tight junction around the brain um, effectively physically separating it from the blood or which is called hemolymphin insects and this blood-brain barrier structure is similar to the ancestral vertebrate blood-brain barrier you see in like sturgeon fish uh, they also have a glial blood-brain barrier um, and are one that's made up of these modified endothelial cells is a more derived characteristic that you see later down the line. So I have been working on my PhD for a while. No one studied the blood-brain barrier in honeybees. It's tricky to study because it's a very thin layer of cells. Um, but I'm in, I was interested for my degree to look at describing the structure of it around the brain and also its function. Uh, just for this study, I'm gonna focus on the function. So I'm just gonna talk about two studies I did uh, one to assess the uh, intrinsic and how, how stress affects the blood-brain barrier, and the other to see how this protein vitelligen is transported into the brain through the honeybee blood-brain barrier. 
So the first study I'm going to talk about is this uh, permeability study. So there's two types of permeability that you can think about the blood-brain barrier. There's molecules that can move through cells, which is transcellular um, transport, or there's paracellular transport, which is molecules that move between the cells of the blood-brain barrier. So I wanted to assess these and do that I used to dyes that basically infiltrate these two different compartments of the blood-brain barrier and I applied some sort of stress or measured uh, honeybees exposed to some sort of stress to see how this permeability changed over different treatments. So the two types of stress that I looked at were both aging and exposure to varroa mites which is one of the many different challenges that honeybees face in their natural environment. Um, and the basic array of how I apply this dye is I collect the bees that I need within the groups, I cut a little piece of their head capsule off, I inject some dye in there, wait a period of time, dissect the brain, and then measure the amount of that dye in the brain, which is uh, measured in fluorescence, fluorescent units. So just a little bit of an insight into what honeybee, uh, what honeybee science looks like. Uh, this first video is of me marking bees that are basically being stopped from entering the hive. So what I'm doing here is I'm marking bees that are already foragers and these foraging honeybees um, I'll come back in two weeks to, to collect them again and the ones that have still are still there are still alive with this purple mark are considered old foragers which I'll explain in a second um, and then the other stress that they look I looked at was varroa mites in this picture to the right is um, you can see a varroa mite it's this little brown insect that's on top of a honeybee larva and these basically go in the comb when the honeybee egg is laid and feeds on the honeybee larva throughout its development. Um, oh yeah, I forgot I added this little meme in there. Um, and honeybees are also, that when they first emerge from the cell, they don't have hard stingers and they can't fly. So it makes it easy to mark new bees and I can track how old they are um, through the mark that I give them and by remembering which day. And then this other setup is just some dye that's applied into the head capsule. So the first uh, stressor that I looked at is aging. Uh, honeybees have an interesting aging structure. They are born in the hive, they do some work around the hive, and at some point in their life, they transition to becoming a forager. And once that transition happens, once they basically first kind of go off on their first foraging flight, it initiates a 14-day timer. And after that 14 days, they will start to senesce rapidly. They'll start to age extremely fast. So by, by marking bees and tracking how old they are and how long they've been foraging, I can basically separate it out into these groups of bees, which are young bees, bees that are foraging but not yet aging rapidly, and then rapidly aging bees. And I can track or I can assess the physiology in these different groups. So what I found with aging is that there's no group in either type of blood-brain barrier permeability amongst the old foragers, the young foragers, and the nurse bees, which are the bees that are in the hive and haven't started um, aging at all yet. Um, and what I believe is happening is that the blood-brain barrier doesn't change with age because foraging is a, is a cognitively heavy task. Honeybees are never, never need to use their brains as much as when they're going out into the environment finding flowers, remembering where those flowers are, and then going back to the hive to communicate that. And so it doesn't make sense that a, a crucial structure for brain health is going to degrade even with, um, ex with this rapid aging. It's one of those things that should be preserved to the very end. So that's my hype, why I think that we received that result. Um, now, the next stressor is I looked at is varroa mites. So what I basically did is I um, had hives at the Arizona State uh, apiary set aside um, not to not be treated for varroa mites. And from those hives, I would collect brood frames and I would wait in the lab for the brood frames, for the bees to emerge from those frames. And when they did, and if they had mites on them, I would count all the mites on there and take that bee, put it in a cage, um, let it like grow up for a day just to kind of solidify that physiology and then assess the permeability of their blood brain barrier um, with the independent variable being how many varroa mites they emerge from the comb with. And here I actually did find a difference. So I found that. Um, Bees that emerged with two to four varroa mites, they had increased transcellular permeability. So the blood brain barrier was letting more things in through the cells. Um, whereas varroa is that varroa, honeybees that were stressed with the varroa mites, no matter how much of a mite load they had, they their paracellular permeability didn't increase. So those junctions between the cells stayed tight. The varroa mites didn't affect that at all. Um, what I think is happening here is has to do with the way that varroa feeds on the honeybees. So uh, during their development, 
honeybees transition from this pupa to a larval stage in between there they go through um, this metamorphosis where all of their guts basically liquefy and this is the time that varroa mites go in like vampires and they suck out the fat body of honeybees during this time fat body is kind of like the equivalent to a liver in an insect it's holds a lot of nutrients a lot of energetic stores are stored in the fat body which is why the varroa mites like them but it also hurts the honeybee in the long run because all of their nutrient stores are basically depleted so the more of these varroa mites feeding on this energetic tissue in these developing honeybees the less energy they have to dedicate to various physiological structures and i think it's possible that the blood brain barrier mechanisms are one of the first things that go um, which is why we see increased transcellular permeability with a higher mite load so that was uh, an assay that I developed based on some fly studies, but I'd never been applied in honeybees before. And it was cool to use these sort of environmental, like non-invasive uh, manipulations to study how the blood brain barrier changes in these natural environments. My next, uh, my, my next study was looking at, was a little bit more high tech. Uh, this is a study that was based off of some previous work done in my lab, looking at this protein Vitelogenin. And I'll come back to this slide in a second, but Vitelogenin is a, protein that's mostly just in egg laying animals uh, it helps uh, provide nutrients into the egg honeybees workers however don't lay eggs they are not reproductive and so vitelogenin has been co-opted in honeybee workers for a variety of different functions and one of the functions that vitelogenin has is it helps to organize the social behavior in honeybees um, now, we found vitelligent in the honeybee brain, but we didn't find any mRNA transcripts, so we know that it's not being made there. So one of my initial studies was just to kind of follow in the path of this line of inquiry in my lab to figure out if vitelligent was being transported across the blood-brain barrier. Now, it's kind of tricky to figure out, you know, track a very extremely strong molecule into a brain through a structure that hasn't been described. So uh, this study is simple in how it looks, but it was, took a lot of um, figuring out to figure out the best technique for it. Um, the technique that I landed on was that I, I basically fed honeybees uh, a, 13, a stable isotope, 13-carbon thir labeled amino acid, which they then created into vitelogenin, and I extracted this vitelogenin out of these like kind of incubating honeybees, isolated the protein, labeled protein, confirmed the labels there, and then injected it into new honeybees. And that way, by injecting this into new honeybees, I could track this carbon-13 label into the brain using a technique called uh, nanosims. And what I would basically do is I would, it allowed me to measure the carbon-13 enrichment in the brain. So a nanosims is a, it's basically like an electron microscope and a mass spec combined into one. You basically have a slice of tissue that you put into this machine and it rasters an ion beam over it, ionizing the top layer of molecules which are then sucked into a mass spec. So it allows you to get a very structurally, structural integrity and integral uh, image that instead of the density of matter, like what you get in an electron micrograph, you're actually getting like in this middle image, a map of some atom. So for instance, this middle image is the ni a nitrogen map of the honeybee brain, like the outer limits, blood brain barrier of the honeybee brain. Um, but it also allows, and using the stable isotope, it allows you to basically track enrichment of carbon-13 inside the brain to see if your labeled molecule made it into the brain and that's what i what i what i basically did in this study and so my prediction is that carbon 13 will be enriched in the blood brain barrier and other glial cells of these honeybees that i injected with this carbon 13 labeled vitelogen and protein um, and after lots of uh maneuvering and lots of finicking with this kind of finicking machine i did find enrichment in multiple uh, in two different regions of the brain um, at multiple time scales. So I had three different time exposures of the uh, proteins. I basically would inject it at 15 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour in separate sets of bees, and then process the brains for the nanosims. And I found that there is enrichment above uh, the natural abundance of carbon-13 in regions of the honeybee brain. And it follows a different pattern in different parts of the brain. So these red boxes are the central body. This is kind of the processing center of the honeybee brain, whereas the blue center is these large optic lobes that process visual input to the honeybee brain. Um, and I found that basically there's different patterns of vitelogenin inside of the brain um, accumulating in these areas. And it's likely different to just different allocation of uh, carrier proteins that transport in these big 
proteins. Um, they, I didn't get to, I wanted to do a study to locate the receptor for the receptor and carrier for vitalogen in the brain, but I didn't get to it during this PhD. Um, but it's likely that this carrier protein is just heterogeneous around the brain. So it's importing it differently. Um, and I think that the, the different accumulation of this protein in the brain suggests its function. Uh, I think that in the brain, it might be serving a, uh, a, a uh, function that's associated with glial cells, like cleaning up around the brain. Uh, one of the things vitelligenin does in the in the body of the honeybee is it scavenges a free radical oxygen species, and so there's lots of um, ROS being produced in the brain. So it's I think it's like the vitelligenin cleaning that up in the brain, allowing the honeybee brain to function um, efficiently. So at the end of the day, uh, some of the things that I learned through the studies is that the honeybee blood-brain barrier is dynamic; it's amenable to stress. Uh, there's changes to the structure and function that might have implications for honeybee cognition and behavior, uh, which are which, which kind of our future studies down the road. And that I believe that honeybee individual and colony health can be improved by reducing stress, which seems important, which seems um, obvious, but it's through finding the stress effects in these physiological structures that, let us, that, that allows us to identify exactly where we need to focus some of our interventions, like maybe brain safe pesticides or another justification to reduce varroa mite load in honeybee colonies. So with that, I uh, thank you guys. You guys can find me on Twitter. Uh, it's probably the best place. My handle's down in the bottom right. Um, I also do, funnily enough, psychedelic science writing. Bellage's microdosing study was one of the first that I've written about, and I only just met him at the same time Michael did, which was awesome. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions you have about bees, behavior, blood-brain barrier, research, et cetera. No, thank you, guys. Oh, you didn't hear that, Tyler, but um, there was a thunderous round of applause for you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. We'll do it one more time for Tyler. Give us another round of applause. So, so what, what, how does this, what, how is this translational into humans? Like, or is it translational into humans? Yeah. So I think that the, the clearest connection, I didn't really get to do any, I, I didn't get to connect this as much as I wanted to during my PhD, but honeybees are probably the best model organism for studying how social environment affects physiology directly. Um, the, the age demographic of a honeybee colony is super influential on how they progress through this like very plastic aging trajectory that honeybee workers can do. And so it's by, you can do these, these social manipulations in honeybee colonies and then assess how it affects various physio physiological structures. For instance, if you take all of the young bees out of a colony, the foragers that come back that have already like started on this aging trajectory, they'll unage and they'll take back up in high responsibilities. And some of like their immune system will ramp back up. Some of their learning uh, cognitive features like come back up compared to the ones that continue foraging. So it's really neat. And it's not, it's no way that insect research is gonna be directly translational, but at least can provide some like insight into where we can look um, in human beings studying how our social environment affects uh, our health, physiology, cognitive decline, et cetera. All right, well, another round of applause for Tyler. Thank you, and we'll be in touch um, shortly, and I will follow up. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity, and hopefully I can come to D-Side New York City in person someday. Next time you're here, let us know, and we'll schedule it for you. Right on. Thank you, guys. Bye. Okay, that concludes this part, but um, thank you all for coming. We can just mix and mingle, and the books finally came, and they're in the back, so if you want a formation book this is like will literally save you fifty thousand dollars on lawyer fees um <laughs> then you should uh you can have the first one yeah and come to the launch which is um which is located here oh the launch there you go and thank you guys for coming on just uh continue to chat with each other